Okay, this next module, module 37, that we're going to look at, we're going to look into infancy and childhood. So now we're talking about after the child is born up through childhood. And we're going to talk about physical development that occurs. We're going to talk about cognitive de development that occurs. We're going to talk about social development that occurs, some sensory development that occurs. So this is quite a long module. So just hang in there. It's probably the longest module out of this chapter. Maybe the longest module of what we've done so far in all the chapters we've talked about. All right, so three questions we are going to answer in this module. One, what are the major comp competencies of newborns? The major competencies of newborns. The second question, what are the milestones of both physical and social development that children go through from the time they are born through childhood? And then the third question is, how does cognitive, cognitive development proceed during childhood? So we're going to talk about physical, social, and cognitive development. Okay, so let's start talking about newborns. So the time that they are born. We just talked about prenatal development. Now we're going to talk about infancy. A neonate is a newborn child. That's what they are called, neonates. And there are various factors in the neonate's strange appearance. There is a squeezing of these not yet completed bones that occur during the trip through the mother's birth canal. So the bones are not yet completed, and yet they're having to squeeze through this birth canal. And so that can give this very strange appearance when the infant is first born. First of all, we have what's called a vernix. A vernix is a white greasy covering for protection before birth. So the infant, the fetus, is covered in this vernix. There's also lanugo, which is this soft fuzz over the entire body of the fetus, of the newborn. And this is similarly also for protection. So they have this white greasy covering, the vernix, and they also have this, this soft fuzz called lanugo. When infants are first born, they have very puffy eyelids, and this is due to an accumulation of fluids in the upside down position, right? The, the infant, the fetus is going to come out head first, hopefully, right? Hopefully, it's going to come out head first. And so when it's in this upside down position in utero, that's what causes these puffy eyelids. From the moment the child is born, the neonate begins to display capabilities that will grow at an astounding rate. There are so many changes that occur in that first year of birth, and it's at an extremely high rate of growth. One thing that we see in neonates are these reflexes. Remember, reflexes are inborn. You do not need to learn them. So these reflexes are unlearned, involuntary responses that occur automatically in the presence of certain stimuli. These reflexes are critical for survival. Many infant reflexes unfold naturally. They just naturally occur. We're going to talk about five of these reflexes that you will see in newborns. The first reflex is known as the routine reflex. This is turning of the head towards things that touch their cheeks. So when an infant um, first breastfeeds, right, the breast is touching their cheek. And so as they are breastfeeding, you know, they're going to, um, they're going to, it touches their cheek. So if you've ever been around a newborn and you take your finger and you stroke the side of their cheek, they're going to turn their head towards that side of the cheek that you are 
that you are touching. This is then going to lead to the second reflex, which is known as the sucking reflex. This prompts infants to suck at things that touch their lips, such as the nipple of a breast if they're breastfeeding, or the nipple of a bottle if they're not breastfeeding. You do not have to teach an infant how to feed. That is a reflex. So usually if there is trouble with an infant breastfeeding, it's not on the it's not on the infant, it's more so on the mother, right? A lot of women need to be taught how to breastfeed. It's not something that comes naturally. It's something that comes naturally to the infant, but not so much to the mother. Third reflex is a gag reflex. This is a clearing of the throat. We also have a startle reflex. This is a series of movements in response to sudden noise. And usually what will happen is the baby will then start to cry because there is this startle reflex that scares them. The fifth reflex is what is called the Babinski reflex. This is when the toes of the foot are actually fanned out when they're stroked. So if you look at an infant's foot and you start to stroke their feet, their toes are actually going to fan out. And that is called the Babinski reflex. Now, this slide you can find at the top of page 385. And this shows you the development that occurs. Now, this should be taken with a grain of salt, right? Because every child will go through this series of development in this same order. However, the age may vary from child to child. So this is sometimes what's very hard for new mothers to look at a chart like this. And if their child is not where they should be when this occurs, they start to get very nervous and they think that there's some sort of developmental disability. But remember that in those first few months of, of, child, of, of child rearing, right, you are going to the pediatrician quite often. And your pediatrician is trained to look at these developmental milestones. And so they are going to notice if your child has any sort of developmental delays. So you can see at 3 to 2 3.2 months the child can roll over. 3.3 they can grasp a rattle. At about almost 6 months they can sit without support. It's seven months they can stand while they're holding on to something. At eight months they can grasp things by holding on with their thumb and forefinger. That's something that does, I mean, it is a reflex and it does occur, but it takes a while for that to occur. At 11 and a half months they can stand alone quite well. At 12 months they should be walking quite well. At 14 months, they should be able to build a tower with different cubes. At 16 and a half months, they should be able to walk upstairs. And then at almost two years old, they should be able to jump in place. And so you can see that this sequence of milestones does occur in this order. However, the age there can be some variability in that because every child is an individual and they're going to develop at different rates. But on average, this is where they should be when we're looking at that physical development that can occur. The next thing to talk about is the sensory development that's taking occur, that's going to occur. So think about senses, right? your vision, your hearing, your touch, your smell, and your taste. So the, you have these five senses that are going to develop in a newborn, infancy and childhood. So by studying habituation, researchers can tell when a child is too young to speak and can detect and discriminate a stimulus. So they're going to look at various habituation studies. And they can tell when the child 
who is too young to speak can detect and discriminate a stimulus. Now, we've talked about habituation previously in this course. Habituation is the decrease in the response to a stimulus that occurs after repeated exposure to that same stimulus, right? Habituation, think of a habit. A habit is something that naturally occurs. So at first, that stimulus may be startling, but over time, you're going to habituate to it. Now, when we look at vision in children, in newborns, vision perception is sophisticated at birth. However, they will not see like that of an adult until they're probably around two, three, four years old. A lot of infants cannot see in color when they are born. So their rods are fully developed, yet their cones are not as much developed. With infants, they prefer patterns with contours and edges. They are aware of size constancy, and infants are very good at discriminating and imitating facial expressions. But like I said, not so much in color. Now, whenever it comes to your sense of hearing, newborn, now we said the vision wasn't like that of an adult until they were much older. However, hearing is almost fully developed to that in adults when they are born. So newborns can distinguish different sounds, including the difference between languages and other speaking. They can also recognize different tastes and different smells at the time that they are born. So their hearing is very good. They can also recognize different tastes and different smells. Now, previously, I think on that chart, I called that physical development and I should have said motor development in that chart from the time when they were rolling over to pulling themselves up to stand, to standing, to walking, to jumping, so on and so forth. That is motor development. What we're gonna talk about now is physical development, the physical development that occurs. So in the first year of life, children are able to gain triple their birth weight. They will triple their birth weight in that first year of life. They will also increase their height by half. So if they are born at seven pounds, within that first year of life, they should be up to 21 pounds. And then if they're born at 24 inches, right, you can add about, you know, 12 more inches onto that, so on and so forth. From age three to about the beginning of adolescence, their growth averages about five pounds and three inches per year. From age three to adolescence, this is a huge amount of growth that occurs during childhood. This next slide, you can see at the top of page 389 in your textbook. And it says, as development prog progresses, the size of the head relative to the rest of the body decreases until the individual reaches adulthood. So you can see newborns, their head is, you know, extraordinarily large to the rest of their body. And then as they develop, their head is going to, you know, not grow as much, but their body is going to grow. So they're going to grow into their head size, I guess you could say, right? So here you have newborns, you have three years old, six years old, 12 years old, and then 25 years old. That their head is actually, you know, the size of their head relative to the rest of their body decreases in its size. So it's not that the head is decreasing, it's just that it's becoming more relative and normal to the size of the rest of the body. 
Okay, so next we look at social behavior, social development from infancy through childhood. The first thing that we see is this sense of attachment. Attachment is the emotional bond that develops between a child and a caregiver. And I use the word caregiver because it's not always the parents that raise the child. Sometimes you have adoptive parents. Sometimes you have, um, you know, grandparents or aunts or uncles that raise their children. Foster parents, right? But attachment is that is that positive bond between the child and the caregiver. Conrad Lorenz was one of the well-known researchers who studied attachment, and he did this with goslings, baby geese. If you Google Conrad Lorenz, you'll probably see a famous picture that shows Conrad Lorenz walking across this lawn, and there are all these little goslings following him. What he did in this research is he removed the mother goose at the time the goslings were born. And he started to care for the goslings. Well, the goslings formed this positive attachment to Conrad Lorenz as though he was their mother. And so they would follow him around everywhere. Now, this attachment and what we have with these goslings following Conrad Lorenz, we call that imprinting behavior. That is behavior that takes place during a very critical period, and it involves the attachment to the first moving object that is observed. So when the goslings were born, Conrad Lorenz removed the mother goose, and the first thing those goslings saw was Conrad Lorenz. And so they attached and they imprinted on him. Harry Harlow is also a well-known researcher studying attachment, and he studied attachment with infant monkeys. And so what he did with these infant monkeys is he gave them a choice between two types of mothers. There was either a wire monkey that provided milk or this soft terry cloth monkey that was warm, but it did not provide milk. Okay, so you have these two um, monkeys, <coughs> so to speak. One was a wire monkey that provided nourishment, so it provided a bottle of milk. The other monkey was a cloth monkey, so it provided warmth, but no milk. And so what Harlow wanted to do is he wanted to see which of these mothers the infant, infant monkeys would attach an imprint on. And what he found, that the milk alone monkey was not enough to create attachment. It was that cloth covered monkey that the infants attached to. And so you can see that in this picture taken from Harlow's study. And this is at the bottom of page 389. Here you have your two mothers, right? You have your wire mother, which provided milk through this bottle. And then you have your cloth covered mo mother, which provided warmth. And as you can see, the infant monkeys wanted to spend more time with the cloth mother. Even though she was not providing nourishment, the monkeys wanted to attach an imprint on that cloth mother. Now, continuing on looking at social behavior from infancy through childhood. Very well-known researcher, Mary Ainsworth, she conducted research looking at a method of measuring attachment. And she had what was called this Ainsworth strange situation scenario. This was a sequence of events involving a child and typically the child's mother. So she looked at th four different types of attachment with these children. So the mother was in the laboratory with the child, right? 
and there would be a stranger that walked in. When the stranger walked in, the mother left. And now the infant was alone with the stranger. At some point in time, the mother walked back into the room. And now what Ainsworth wanted to see is how that infant behaved when the mother walked back into the room. So this was the sequence of events that she used to measure attachment. And so one of those is secure attachment. So securely attached children employ the mother as this home base from which they can explore. When she leaves, they are very distressed. However, when she returns, they go to her and they are extremely happy to see her. That shows secure attachment. When the mother is gone, they are very upset. When the mother returns, they want to run up to her. Okay, you also have three other types of kind of insecure attachment. And they talk about these at the top of page 390. You have avoidant children. This is where the children do not cry when the mother leaves the room. And when the mother returns, they tend to avoid her as if they were indifferent to her. So that is avoidant insecure attachment. The second type of insecure attachment is ambivalent insecure attachment or ambivalent children. So this is where children display anxiety before their mother leaves the room. And when the mother returns, so when the mother leaves, they may be separated and upset. So when the mother returns, they seek close contact, but simultaneously they hit and kick her. So they're upset whenever they she leaves, but whenever she returns, they do approach her, but they're very upset at her. Now the third type that you will see of insecure attachment is disorganized and disoriented children. These children show inconsistent and often contradictory behavior. So when the mother returns, they may approach her, but they're going to do so with a very slow going towards her and they're going to avoid eye contact. With this third type, this disorganized, disoriented, you see this a lot in cases of child abuse. So when the caregiver returns, the mother or father returns, they will approach them because they know that's what they're supposed to do, but they do so in a very slow manner and they avoid eye contact. Now, still continuing on with social behavior, infancy through childhood, we see that the nature of a chat attachment between children and their mothers has far-reaching consequences. And that's what Mary Ainsworth kind of showed in that previous study that we just talked about. More recent research has highlighted the father's role in parenting. Previous research really only looked at the mother's role, some of the more historical research. More recent research looks at the father's role in parenting. There are, a number of there are a number of fathers who are the primary caregivers for their children, and that has grown significantly. Previously, historically, it was mainly the mothers, but more recently, there are significantly more fathers who are the primary caregivers. When it is the father who is the primary caregiver, they engage in more physical and rough and tumble activities than what they would have done if their mother was the primary caregiver. When it comes to the nature of attachment, it is very similar to fathers who are the primary caregivers as it was to mothers who are the primary caregivers. So we tend to not see as much difference 
between um, fathers and mothers when it comes to the nature of attachment. Now, when it comes to play behavior with social behavior that we see developing, by the time the children are two years old, they prefer to play with peers or friends. This playing with peers or friends helps the children interpret the meaning of others' behaviors, and it helps them develop the capacity to respond appropriately. So one thing that we see is what is called parallel play. This is where children play physically near each other, but they don't try to influence each other's behavior. They may play physically near each other, but they don't try to influence each other's behavior. Another way that children learn about their social, wor social world is through the media. However, face-to-face -face interaction and physical activity should be maximized. That will give you the ultimate type of learning about their social world. They do tend to do that more so with media now, whether they have, you know, there are different types of media toys for infants and children. However, it is always best to have that face-to-face -face interaction or physical activity that they have with other children. In today's world, it's not always likely that children will be raised in the home until they start kindergarten, right? There are many children who are raised, so to speak, outside of the home. And what we call that is childcare outside of the home. The main question we have is do childcare arrangements outside the home benefit children's development? In the cases of high quality childcare centers, this can positively impact the child. What research has found is that children in childcare are more considerate and sociable than other children. And they interact more positively with teachers. They may also regulate their behavior more effectively than children who have childcare inside the home. For many children where their home environment is a very poor or disadvantaged home environment. Going to a child care center for those children can lead to more intellectually stimulating environments than what they may have in their home environment. So these scenarios show us with high quality child care centers, it can actually benefit them going into child care. However, Low quality child care centers provide little or no gain, and they may actually hinder development in children. So it really depends on the type of child care center there is on whether or not child care outside of the home is beneficial to those children. So we're still going to continue on with social development, but we're going to look at parenting styles and how those can affect social development in children. There was a classic research study done by Baumrind, Diana Baumrind, and it identified four main, character, four main categories in these parenting, child, parenting styles. Diana Baumrind's classic research identifying four main categories in parenting styles. The first type of parenting style is an authoritarian parent. These are parents who are rigid and punitive and value unrequesting obedience from their children. 
They want to tell their children what the, to do, and they want their children to do it. They don't want their children to question why they're being asked to do this. They just want their child to do it. That's an authoritarian parent. The second type is a permissive parent. These are parents who give their children relaxed or inconsistent direction, and even though they are warm, they require very little of them. So these are kind of like the laid back chill parents, right? They let their children do what they want. They're very warm and caring, but they don't require too much interaction with the children. The third type is an authoritative parent. So this is like authoritarian, but a little bit different. An authoritative parent is a parent who is firm. They set clear limits. They may reason with their children and they explain why they're doing the things they are doing. And then the fourth type of parenting style is the uninvolved parent. These are parents who show very little interest in their children and they are very much emotionally detached from their children. Now, this slide you can find in your book, and this is at the top of page 393, and this table is just a summarization of those four parenting styles. So it'll give the parenting style, authoritarian, authoritarian permissive, authoritative, or uninvolved. It's going to show the behavior the parent shows, and then the type of behavior that you will see in the child. So the parenting style will lead to a certain type of behavior in children. And that's what this third column in this table shows. If we want to sum up these parenting styles and social development, we find that children of authoritative parents tend to fare the best. Again, authoritative, not authoritarian. The children of authoritative parents tend to fare the best. However, in many cases, non-authoritative parents also produce perfectly well-adjusted children. And these children bring their own temperament to the mix. When we discuss temperament, we're talking about this basic inborn characteristic way of responding and behavioral style. That is what we mean by temperament of a child. Now, because children are also individualized and different from each other, they vary considerably in their degree of resilience. When we talk about this word resilience, what we mean is it is the child's ability to overcome circumstances that place the children at high risk for psychological or even physical harm. The next thing that I want to talk about is Erickson's theory of psychosocial development. And we will come back to Erickson's theory, I can't say it right, Erickson's theory throughout the rest of this chapter. Because we have Erickson's theory on psychosocial development in infants and children. We have Erickson's theory of psychosocial development in adolescents. We have Erickson's theory of psychosocial development in adults, okay? But since this module is talking about infancy and childhood, that's where we're going to talk about Erickson's theory of psychosocial development. So Eric Erickson was a psychoanalyst, and he developed one of the more comprehensive theories of social development. And he said there are a series of eight stages of psychosocial development. 
Erickson said there are a series of eight stages of psychosocial development. So what we mean by psychosocial development before we talk about these stages is psychosocial development is a development of an individual's interactions and understanding of each other and also their knowledge and understanding of themselves as members of society. So psychosocial development is your knowledge and understanding of other people, but also your knowledge and understanding of yourself within society. Okay, so let's talk about Erickson's theory of psychosocial development in infancy and childhood. So the first stage, he said, is called trust versus mistrust. And this is where infants between birth to age one and a half develop feelings of trust or they have this lack of trust. So you'll see as we go through Erickson's stages, it is a this versus that. You either gain this or you develop that. So one is good, the other is not so good. So in the trust versus mistrust, Infants between birth to one and a half years old, they either develop these feelings of trust or they have a lack of trust. The next stage is autonomy versus shame and doubt. So in this one, toddlers aged one and a half to three, they will develop independence and autonomy if exploration and freedom are encouraged with them. However, if exploration and, incur and freedom are not encouraged, then they may develop self-doubt if they are restricted and overprotected. So that's between one and a half and three years old. So, so far we have trust versus mistrust, autonomy versus shame and doubt. The next one is initiative versus guilt. So now this is between children ages three to six, and they may experience conflict between being independent of their actions and sometimes a negative result of that action. So taking the initiative versus having this guilt. So that's between ages three and six. Now the next stage is industry versus inferiority. And this is ages children six to 12. So this then takes us up to adolescence. So we started at birth and now we're up to age 12. So industry versus inferior, inferior, inferiority. They may develop positive social interactions with others, or they may feel inadequate and therefore become less social. So we here we have Erickson's first four stages. Starting at birth and going through 12 years old. We'll come back to Erickson again in with adolescence and then with adulthood. But these are the first four. Okay, now we're gonna move on to cognitive development. And this is children's thinking about the world. So with cognitive development, it is the process by which a child understands that the world changes as a function of age and experience. The process by which a child's understanding of the world changes as a function of both age and experience. And there has been no one more impactful in understanding cognitive development than Jean Piaget. He is one of the leading researchers historically and even still today when it comes to childhood cognitive development. He suggested that children go through a series of four stages in a very fixed order. 
And we're going to talk about these in just a moment. They go through these four stages of cognitive development. The first stage is a sensory motor stage. This is a stage between birth to two years old. And the child has little competence in representing the environment. And they do this by using images, language, or other symbols. They have little competence in representing the environment by using images, language, or symbols. Or symbols because they may not have those yet. So in this sensory motor stage, these children lack what is known as object permanence. They have not yet developed object permanence. Object permanence is this awareness that even though you can't see something, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So objects or people continue to exist even if they are out of sight. So when a child is in this sensory motor stage, if their caregiver is playing on the floor with them in the living room and they leave to go to the kitchen and they're out of that infant's sight, that infant may start to cry because they don't realize that the caregiver just went to the kitchen. Now, that is they lack object permanence. That is birth to two years old. Now, the next stage is from two years old to seven years old. And this is known as the pre-operational stage. The main characterization of the pre-operational stage is language development. Remember, that's what was lacking in the pre or the, uh, the, the sensory motor stage, the one we just talked about. Pre-operational children tend to use egocentric thought and they had not yet developed the ability to comprehend the principle of conservation. So these are two things that they are lacking. Now, they may have gotten at this point in the pre-operational stage, they now get this object permanence. However, they are now lacking two other things. The first thing that they can't grasp is what they have is egocentric thought. And that is where they think that their point of view is the only point of view. They can't yet think to understand that someone has another point of view. This is where a lot of playground fights, I think, happen, right? I think purple is the best color. No, it isn't. Blue is the best color. No, it isn't. Purple is. No, it isn't. Blue is, right? They don't understand that someone else may have a best color. So that is what is missing with these children. That is what we call egocentric thought. When we talk about principle of conservation, it's the knowledge that the quantity is unrelated to the physical appearance of objects. So you have a cup of milk and you pour that cup of milk into a short fat glass or a tall thin glass and you ask them which one they prefer. Most children will prefer the tall thin glass because it looks like more. So they don't understand that just because you change the physical property, that does not mean that you change the amount. So they have egocentric thought and this principle of conservation that they have not yet developed. So this slide is taken from your book. And you can find this slide at the top of page 397. And you can see the conservation of number, the conservation of mass, of length, of area, of weight, and of volume. Volume is the one I talked about, right, where you pour it into two different glasses. You could also give them some Play-Doh. And you have some Play-Doh in this big ball 
and then you take Play-Doh and you make it really flat. If you ask them which one they prefer, they'd probably prefer the ball because it looks like more. It's still the same amount, but they have not yet grasped that. Now the next stage they go through is the concrete operational stage. And this is from seven to 12 years old. And it is characterized by both logical thought and the loss of egocentrism. So now they can think of logic and they have lost that egocentrism that they previously had. However, their thinking is still largely bound to concrete physical aspects of the world. They have to see it to understand it. Still at this concrete operational stage. The last stage of Piaget's cognitive development is the formal operational stage. And this is the period from about 12 years old into adulthood. And this is now characterized by abstract thinking. Some individuals may never reach this stage. This is a table, figure eight, that you can find in your textbook. Oh, I thought I had it in the textbook. Yes, it is. This is at the top of page 396. And, it, and there's a picture of Jean Piaget there also. But it just breaks down the four cognitive stages, the various ages that you can find within those stages, and in the major characteristics of those stages. So once children reach that formal operational stage, right, they can think abstractly. So they can think mentally. That's now leading into this next area, which is information processing. And this is charting children's mental programs. So information processing is the way in which people take in information, they use the information, and they store the information. So this sounds very similar to what we were talking about when we were talking about memory in the cognitive chapter. It's the way they take in, use, and store information. There are several significant changes that occur in children's information preceding capabilities. And we have three different ones to discuss. One is it increases in the speed of processing. As children age, they get better at processing information. The second one, as children age, there are dramatic improvements in their memory. And then the third one is that there are advances in metacognition. Metacognition is this awareness and understanding of your own cognitive processes. So information processing, how you take in, use, and store information, and there are significant changes. There is an increase in the speed of processing. There is a dramatic improvement to their memory, and there are advances in metacognition. Now, the very last thing to talk about in this module, I told you this was a pretty long module that we've been talking about here, but the very last slide is Vitkowski's view of cognitive development. And this is where we're considering culture when we're talking about our cognitive development. So according to the developmental psychologist Lev Vygotsky, 
cognitive development occurs as a consequence of the social interactions that we have with other individuals. Cognitive development occurs as a consequence of social interactions. So children work with others to jointly solve their problems. Children work with others to jointly solve their problems. We also have what is called the ZPD, or the Zone of Proximal Development. The ZPD is the gap between what children already are able to accomplish on their own and what they're not quite capable of doing on their own yet. So it's the zone of proximal development. It's the time between the, when they're able to do things on their own and when they're not quite able to do things yet on their own. And in this last term is called scaffolding. If you think about what a scaffold is, right? If you're doing construction, you use a scaffold to step on to reach higher places. So scaffolding, when we're talking about cognitive development, it's the support for learning and problem solving that encourages independence and growth. So scaffolding is actually a great thing when we're talking about cognitive development. It is that support that we get for learning and problem solving that encourages our independence and growth. 